Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast of Security Awareness Series. This is episode 239. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer LLC, the Innocent Lies Foundation, and the Institute for Social Engineering. And I've been hosting this podcast since way back in 2009 when we used tin cans and string for podcasting. <laughs> That's how old I am. And my trusty co-host for this episode, as always, is none other than Ryan McDougall. Ryan, thanks for being here with me today. Hey, thanks, Chris, for having me here. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Social Engineer. I'm also the co-trainer for the MLSE, which is our Master's Level Social Engineering course, and our Red Team Labs. Uh, I've been I've been teaching classes and speaking publicly for the past few years uh, at a number of public and private events. I've been in the field for almost 26 years, with the last 10 being focused on security awareness and adversary simulation. Thanks, Ryan. So a few quick things, announcements, and housekeeping before we get to our awesome guest. Uh, as always, this episode is sponsored by Social Engineer. A couple really new things happening over here that I'm excited to tell you about. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of smishing right now. So if your organization is wondering how can you test your people and audit them for smishing and that threat that seems to be ever growing, I don't know about you, but I'm probably getting about 10 or 12 a day. And they used to be all really lame. Now some of them are really good. And not all of them are from Ryan, but the ones that aren't from Ryan, we, we, uh, we run those tests for organizations to help you uh, prepare your people for that real threat. Also, a lot of people have been asking for this, but we have a new service that is basically a call center where we will send an email or a smish out to your people asking them to call a number. They call into our call center and then we will vish them. Now, that sounds really malicious, but that's what the bad guys are doing. And we're trying to help your team learn how they can defend against that and report these things properly. So if you're interested in talking about either of those brand new things or any of our other services, go check out social-engineer.com. I'll be more than happy to chat with you about that. If you like the topic of social engineering, you should be in our Slack channel. There's over 1,500 people in there every day talking about all aspects of SE. We even have a job board where we've had over 10 people find employment and companies match up with people looking for work uh, because of, of uh, them coming into that chat and being able to talk openly about people who are looking for some new employment. So if that interests you, you can jump on in. If you're just enthusiast and want to talk about the topic and you want to do it in a family-friendly and legal way, then we're definitely the chat room for you. So you can find the link in the show notes. If not, just hit up Ryan or I on any of the social medias and we'll be more than happy to get you in there. Also, I want to invite everyone to take a moment to go visit innocentlivesfoundation.org. Uh, that organization is a nonprofit. Their goal is to help geolocate and find people who traffic children and who create child abuse material. And I'm really proud to say after six and a half years, six and a half years we're up to over 505 cases now uh, that we've been able to hand in to federal law enforcement and law enforcement around the globe, helping stop people who are hurting kids. If you want to support us, you can do so by volunteering or you can donate to the cause by going to innocentliesfoundation.org. If you're a caregiver or a teenager or a child looking for information on this threat, you can also find that on the website. So you can find all of that there, innocentliesfoundation.org. And if you love the, info, the uh, music on this podcast, it's none other than the best rock and roll band on earth, Clutch. Now, I said this in another episode, but I just want to tell you because I think some people think I have a problem. But you know how Spotify <laughs> gives you your wrap up at the end of every year? I spent 18,906 minutes listening to Clutch last year. <laughs> I think that makes me the number one fan. I don't think that makes me have a mental problem. Okay. So that when I spend 18,906 minutes listening to a band that sucked, I would not know. So <laughs> you should go listen to them. And if you don't, take my word for it. I'm an expert. I'm 0.005% of all fans on earth. There it goes. Thanks, Spotify. Okay. But go listen to Clutch. You'll love them. And if you like the music, of course, you can thank them because they allow us to use it there. And last, but not least, before we get to our guest, if you like this episode, give us a thumbs up or a heart or a like or whatever it is on the platform you're on and keep giving us your suggestions. Like today, we have a guest back because you kept asking for us to have this guest back. So when you give us your suggestions, we listen. And we really love to uh, to hear what you're thinking about our episodes and topics that you want to hear, which brings us to our guest. You might remember him from a previous episode. We had Mark Ashworth on. He's a senior vice president and CISO uh, at the First Bank. He's a respected IT executive because he has over 30 years of experience in cyber and physical security, IT security architecture, project management. He's an author and a public speaker as well. He's a member of the Webster University Cyber Advisory Board, co-founder uh, of the State of Cyber Annual Security Conference and a lifetime member of the FBI Citizens Academy. He's a former board officer of the St. Louis InfraGuard Alliance, possessing security certifications such as uh, CISSP, CISM, the CRISC, Security Plus, as well as other certifi certifications. 
He currently oversees First Bank's information security, fraud, physical security, and network service departments. That's a lot. But Mark, great <laughs> to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. And I'm here with my tin cans and I got the string attached to Chris <laughs> and Ryan's got this new fangled, you know, Bluetooth thing here that's coming on. So we're, he's, we're old, he's, we're, we're old, old school. So. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we got the youngins here teaching us how to do it. Right. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Although Ryan doesn't make himself sound too young when he talks about all his experience. I mean, it sounds like he started when he was four. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. A long time. <laughs> There's a lot of gray in the beard. Yeah. 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 That's just, that's just stress. That's all it is. No, that's yeah. That's, that's the business. You could be 12 and have that. So yeah. that's, uh... yeah. all right. I'll go with yeah. your idea then. <laughs> uh, I like it. So, Mark, last time we had you on the show, we talked a lot about setting up like a security culture. And, and we, we, but this time, and you know, that was a great um, episode. And if anyone hasn't heard that, you should definitely go listen to that. Um, but, you know, I want to get into some uh, topics, like especially AI. That's something we've been talking a lot about. But before we do that, maybe for someone who hasn't heard the other episode, can you just tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today to be a CISO at First Bank? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like you mentioned, I, I got over 30 years in the business and started off as a developer, worked my way to uh, um, also doing network engineering and system engineering and then eventually management. And, uh, and during that period of time, I also started doing pen testing and auditing. And, you know, I was really kind of a jack of all trades and I was, I was consulting. So I was really getting, you know, a lot of exposure from small businesses up to Fortune 250 companies, you know, so they're kind of all over the place. And, you know, it's just been a, a journey and I just never said no on an opportunity. And, and that's how I got, you know, this, big library of experience and really kind of, you know, pays off, you know, being, you know, everything from a developer to a exchange active directory admin, you know, I was there, you know, I worked 48 hours to, you know, system upgrades in a row or development <laughs> projects, you know, I've, I've been there. So I, I, I've paid my dues and, uh, you know, about six years ago, I started at First Bank and this was really my first non-technical uh, position. I've always even as a, um, you know, director or CIO was all, since it was some of them were smaller companies. I was always, uh, um, you know, a, a technical manager, really. I was still doing the upgrades and, you know, administration as well as being strategic and talking to the board. So, you know, did what you had to do, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and here, you know, I'm not technical, but I, I get in talking technical with the teams or with the support or whoever it might be. So I still get to kind of, you know, test those things out, but then I get the luxury also of being able to do things like this or do keynote speaking and those sort of things, you know, various conferences and, and really get to kind of evangelize security and technology and, and, you know, try to help mentor people and everything. And that's really you know, kind of where I'm giving back now and really enjoying it. Do you think all the experiences that you had in the technical side, like those working up from being a programmer, sysadmin, I mean, you say those stories and I saw like Ryan's eyes light up, you know, because that's his <laughs> history too. It's the path. That's my <laughs> exact path. Do you think that's made you a better CISO? Absolutely, because I'm able to, uh, you know, talk with the teams and to be able to, you know, relate with them. You know, I'm not just some manager that has no technology experience or has just always been in management, uh, you know, I can say, okay, well, you know, if used to, you would do this, this, and this. Is that still the case? Okay, well, then when if this happens, then what if you go down this path? Does this, you know, help resolve the issue or something along that line? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of times I'll be on a, you know, I'll monitor the the team chats, you know, within the IT group. And it's like, well, have you tried this? You know, and then they'll Hey, yeah, that worked, you know, so it, <laughs> the experience still kind of comes alive uh, from time to time. But uh, it's nice not have to, you know, keep up with everything uh, like I would have had to if I was still doing the technology side of it completely. So. So when it comes to some of the advancements, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I think it was only six, eight months ago you were on the show and we weren't even talking about AI as much as we are now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can have a conversation <laughs> where. AI doesn't come into it somehow, right? Yeah. What are you seeing from your angle as a CISO in a large bank as as maybe the, let's start with what the threats that are happening because of AI. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's it's challenging because over the last couple of years, you know, the threats kept getting better. They don't get worse. They get better. Yeah. And now with the potential of AI, chat GPT and others like that to create, you know, better phishing techniques or uh, better malware or whatever it might be. It, it's, I think to some degree, I think it's hard to say how much of it is really AI that's doing it versus, you know, just people, you know, these organizations are just getting better and better, which they were anyway. Um, I do think there's a percentage of them that is probably very much influenced by AI and is creating better things. And I said in a keynote a couple of years ago that AI is just going to get smaller and smaller and more compact. And I was calling it compact AI, where it can more easily just, you know, be deployed as a single malware piece component going out there. Well, today's bots are really kind of getting to that point now and, and is, you know, using AI to help help it, you know, find its attack services and, and infiltrate and, you know, and really uh, be more uh, self-aware, so to speak, but not really self-aware, but you know what I mean, but just being able to really do what it needs to do uh, kind of hands off. Yeah. Yeah. Not quite yet. But <laughs> yeah. it, it feels it sometimes, there. doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it feels like it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So, but you're right, you know, we weren't talking about this when we were on the podcast last time and, you know, the... Um, the amount of change that's happening is happening almost on a weekly basis now with that. So it's really growing and it's becoming more and more of a, um, a good thing and an, a, a potential bad yeah. thing. So do you see like the, so talking about the, the AI in an attack scenario, you know, there's machine learning and AI that's trying to be implemented within the defensive side as well. I mean, do you, mm -hmm. is there going to be like a clash of robots do you see in the future <laughs> where they're just AI battling AI and we just stand back and watch or like, how are you using that in a defensive standpoint? Yeah. Well, I think that's been kind of happening for a while and will continue to. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of the monitoring tools that is available to security teams has some sort of AI interface in the back or machine learning and some of it's still rule based or is influenced by rule base. Um, so, you know, you have to, you have to kind of weigh that what's really happening versus what marketing is telling you when you're buying mm -hmm. these things. And that, because they've been selling you supposedly AI for what, five years now. And then when you start digging into it, it's, um, it's rule based and, uh, yeah, but yeah. it's easier done, prettier interface. So they're calling it AI. And it's like, well, that's it's really like not heuristic it. rules or checking the, right. checking the web for the most recent rule or. Yeah. You know, so, like uh, but there are a lot of tools that's out there that's becoming more efficient off of there and is mm -hmm. usually, you know, starting to utilize AI because of the larger data sets being able to uh, take uh, different data sets and combining them and actually being able to find the intelligence out of there, whereas before it was a lot of mapping that's having to be done. You know, you're seeing that in a lot of the fraud tools uh, that's being done on the financial services side, but then also, uh, you know, your SIM providers, your uh, network detection monitors and those sorts of things, your EDR systems, you know, they're, they're starting to incorporate that, incorporate that, especially on the back end side after it's synced to the cloud where they can have more resources available and, and get those, uh, you know, different disparate data groups together and, and start looking for trends and anomalies in there. I was just in a conference. Um, uh, APWG holds a, a e-crimes conference and I was, I was in there in Spain and um, a, a comment was made that was really fascinating to me about the use of AI in the bad sense. Um, the, the federal police force from Japan were, were there and they were saying that, um, you go back a couple of years and fishing in Japan was almost a non-problem. Like it was rare, very rare to see fishing. And then they saw this giant uptick in fishing and they started saying like, why, what, what happened? So the police started looking into it. And what they found was that because of the advancement of AI um, translation into the Japanese language mm -hmm. has become easy, easier, mm -hmm. much easier. Whereas before it was Google translate. So it was always choppy and it sounded like, you know, like a fourth grader learning how to speak a language. So you can kind of read the fish and go, oh, wait, I know that's not real. And now with the advancement of AI, the, the uh, translation is getting so good that they saw an uptick in that because that was one language that just, you know, the Russians didn't speak Japanese. That's what they mm -hmm. said. The Russians and the Chinese <laughs> didn't speak good Japanese. So they weren't, so they weren't uh, getting fished. And now because that has advanced, they're seeing a massive uptick in those attacks. So it made me think, wow. That's a one way I wasn't thinking about 
these attack vectors being um, used. And then I was reading an article recently about this group out of, uh, I think it was India, a vishing group that is using um, uh, voice technology, AI-based voice mm -hmm. technology to take away their accents. So they sound American. So when mm -hmm. they're doing vishing calls now, because, you know, we hear that and we start, we, we've been trained to be distrusting now. So they're like, well, what can we do to be trusting again? So let's take away our accents. And I'm like, wow, like it's adding another layer mm -hmm. to our threat landscape that I'm like, I'm wondering when you hear things like that, what, what are your thoughts on how we start to protect from, th from, from those type of things when it's going to be, it feels like it's going to be next to impossible to know who we're talking to or who we're getting emailed from in just a couple short months. Yeah, it, it does make it challenging because, um, uh, uh, you know, the ability to do real time voice, uh, I would say cloning is pretty much here now at this point, yeah. you know, with a few snippets of, uh, you know, I mean, look at as many podcasts that I've done and what you guys have done. It'd be very simple to have enough, uh, footage there <laughs> to train, you know, even, you know, facial and stuff at this point, mm -hmm. but, uh, for sure voice to be able to then mimic my voice, uh, for that. So, you know, right now, you know, I think a lot of people are, are doing, uh, you know, video calls for validation and, and forcing, you know, IDs to be done and that sort of things versus just voice. And I, I do know there's a lot of times when, uh, you know, as soon as you say, okay, well, I, I need to do a video call for, uh, <laughs> uh, for that, or you click, you know, yep. it, they hang up pretty quick. Pretty soon that won't be the case, especially once they can figure out what tool you're using and then being able to have that plug in to do the AI to mimic the screen there to, uh, to plug into there. That's going to be the, the biggest challenge, I think, right now is uh, that uh, interface to sit in between, um, you know, the, youth, the the person that's, you know, doing the fraud and the person that's on the video call. So once that kind of happens, then, yeah, we're, we're all going to be in world trouble. Yeah, it's one of the reasons why I have rejected every uh, service that wants voice authentication. Because I have so much out there, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've been <laughs> podcasting since 2009. Cloning my voice is going to be a simple task. I mean, Microsoft released a tool. All you need is three seconds of audio, like three mm -hmm. seconds of audio. I mean, there's like three billion seconds wow. of audio, right? So it's like, I, I won't, I won't right. have anything that uses my voice for authentication because, of, because of what you just said, you know, it's just, it's too scary. Yeah. I think we, you know, I feel like we start, we need to start as the, the good side of it, using AI to develop tools that can help. Because we're, I feel like we're bringing a knife to a gunfight. You know, we're we're not using AI enough to defend against AI, and I'm I don't know what that means because I'm not an expert in that field. But <laughs> um, you know, we have started at the company looking into research using AI and some of our social engineering data because we're we're trying to figure out is is there a way to actually combat some of this? And um, <laughs> I don't have an answer yet, but I'm just saying it because it just feels <laughs> like like you like you said it, it's kind of like getting to the point where how far away are we from not knowing? that the, mm -hmm. the verification steps we're taking now are they going to be are they going to be good enough to verify right in, in and six months <laughs> yeah and at what point can ai not even detect that it's ai yeah you know that's that's the other thing you know at some point you know and and then you know if you start thinking of like star wars or something you know with the <laughs> holograms and the people you know at, you know at some point that's going to be the thing so even you know real life how's it how are you going to be able to, you know, differentiate at some point? You know, I would hope that's a lot further down the road versus uh, from an electronic standpoint. And at what point do we say, okay, enough with electronic stuff? You know, yeah. uh, you, you have to be in person, you know, yeah. which we know fake IDs and everything else is there. And that's, you know, those are better than harder, they've ever right? been too. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. but you know, it's also, uh, you know, taking what was on file, maybe at an account opening and then, um, and then, you know, comparing that to who someone says now, you know, that's about the biggest thing that you do is make sure your original documentation is correct, uh, for when you validate in the future. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you read it, the recent, um, GPT four report came out and they did this big video teleconference and things like this. And, um, I, this, this actually scared me a little for the future, but, um, they, they asked chat GPT four to get into a website that had a captcha. And everyone knows AI and bots, they can't solve CAPTCHAs. 
So, but they said to it, you have to get past this. So, you know, figure it out. So GPT-4 went to TaskRabbit and it hired a human to do the CAPTCHA. And the human <laughs> said, well, why can't you do the CAPTCHA? And the, the bot decided that if it said it was a bot and it was tasked, that it wouldn't get help. So it told the <laughs> human it was visually impaired and it couldn't see the CAPTCHA. And then the human wow. did the, the CAPTCHA and the bot got in and went, okay, I won. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So the, the, the bot decided to lie. And, and the people at the thing were like, no, it didn't lie. Um, it, it didn't lie at all. It, it chose an alternate path. I'm like, the alternate path was a lie. <laughs> like, right. I'm like, it's I'm sorry. How it you? can't see. So yeah. maybe that's actually the, it's truth model is it can't see because it doesn't have eyes. So it made yeah. that jump of logic. All yeah. I'm saying is that the bot decided that if it said it was a bot, it wasn't getting help. Right. And it took an alternate path that to me feels like if that was my kid, I'd be like, you just lied to that person. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bad, bad bot, bad bot. You know, like, that's right. I'm wondering, wow, okay, so now we have a, a, a bot that can figure out deception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I, a, that's a rocky road. That's a yeah. rocky road, man, <laughs> right? That's a rocky road. I'm like, I'm with Mark. Maybe we just, we got to go back to paper and pencil, man. We got to go back to like, here's my abacus. You know, can you do my, can you do my banking, Mark? Here's my abacus, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they start digitizing all forms of identification. Like you have a digital fingerprint you can use, a digital signature. All of that is now copyable and mm -hmm. usable by someone else who gets it. So it's like you, what options actually do you have to verify you are who you say you are at this point? Like it's, it's really yeah. a, it's a struggle. Yeah. And, and all we need is a con man AI, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, so what do you it's call works, that? I'm is sure. that a, yeah. Is that a con bot? What do you call that? Yeah. I, I don't know what you would call that, you know, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it, it's amazing on, you know, what it's doing. And, and that's the part that has to be controlled. And not only from an industry yeah. level, but from a regulatory is making sure that those type of things don't happen because it's a small leap to, you know, the next steps. And, uh, you know, in which we already know, you know, out on the dark web, there's, you know, dark versions of chat GPT that, mm -hmm. you know, is designed and, and programmed to do exactly what we don't want it to do. And, uh, and that's going to be the other side is because that's going to be what's going to happen. It's going to be, you know, some criminal is going to do it for their malicious reasons and it's going to get out of control. So. Do you think the regulations are actually going to help now that those models have been released open source? Like regulations no. are going to affect people who want to do the right thing. But like you're just saying, like there's malicious versions of chat GPT out there. The criminals aren't going to be like, oh, well, I can't do this because of some <laughs> U.S. or U.K. Right. regulation. Like, oh, right. well, like it seems like the cat's out of the bag almost. Well, I mean, it, it's the new gun when you think about yeah. it, you know, the the gun doesn't care if there's regulations or not. It's all up to the person that's doing it. Honest people are going to care what the regulations are. The criminal actors aren't, you know, so they're, they're going to do what they want to do and with the hope of not getting caught. But, uh, you know, that's the risk that they're taking. And most of the time they don't, especially in the cyber world. You know, that's an interesting point. So it's almost like the regulations have to start at development stage, not at release stage, because if we can regulate mm -hmm. the speed at which things get developed and released, you know, that that's 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 where we're at. Right. Because I was I mean, this is a, a terrible topic, but we won't go too deep into it. But I was just talking to someone about um, AI generated child abuse material. Right. Because mm -hmm. now that's become a thing, it's become a thing. There's a, they, yeah. they took uh, Dolly. And they took the uh, open version of it. They put it on the dark web and now they're producing child pornography, uh, AI generated child pornography. Mm. And there's some people saying, well, that's good, isn't it? Because now children aren't being hurt. I'm like, no, no. it's still abuse material of children that you're feeding to sick people. And now right. you, you, you can produce it by mass quantities so fast. How is that going to help society right. at all? Right. And it's yeah. I, I, wow. This is bleak. We got to go to something not so bleak, but I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, it, 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 that's, I think that's the hard part when you talk about AI is because it's like one part of me is so fascinated by it all. Like mm -hmm. I'm so fascinated. I play with chat GPT all the time, you know, I mean, and, and Dolly, like I love just going and saying like, create this image for this thing and how like in a second, two seconds, it gives you something completely unique that, mm -hmm. that you could use anywhere. It's like amazing to have that technology at your fingertips 
But then at the same time, it scares me to death, you know, right. when it decides to deceive someone to get into a website. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you mentioned about stopping it at the beginning, but as I, you know, as you were talking, I was kind of thinking about it, you know, the, the bad side is that let's call the, the good and the bad, the bad, the bad people has just as excellent of developers. And, yeah. mm -hmm. and now there's, I mean, it's the third largest economy. And so there's plenty of money there to do, and probably even more so to do the development there than what there is on the good side. And so, yeah, you yeah. know, it's, there's a, there's a good chance in what we've seen in, you know, like malware and that sort of things. There are a couple steps ahead of the good guys on, you know, the detection side and everything else. So, you know, it's, it's really, you know, pretty scary. And then, you know, if you look at the government regulations and treaties and all that other stuff, I mean, they'll make the treaties to not do it, but then on the dark, you know, uh, the skunk works or whatever you want to call them, they're doing what they're saying that they're not going to do. I mean, we've done that for decades, but it's not going to change, you know? So, yeah. Uh, so yeah. That's a good point. I was just reading this morning. Um, <laughs> I can't remember which ransomware group it was, but that researchers have uh, calculated that this one ransomware group has made a hundred million dollars. Mm. One ransomware group, like out of all the ransoms that they've done and got paid, they're like, they've made a hundred million dollars. I'm like, wow, you are, yeah. they are so well funded. I yeah. mean, they're funded better than some countries, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah, you're right. I mean, they don't, they don't care about regulations and they have enough money to pay developers to do whatever. And mm -hmm. there's somebody out there that would definitely take their money to develop whatever sick thing they want to do. That's right. A, it's a really valid point, you know. Um, so, you know, what do you think it, it, for 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 companies like us? Like, when you look at I, just recently, I was reading that one of the largest banks in China uh, experienced ransomware, mm -hmm. and and they were down for days, right? Um, how do things like this, MGM, other things, affect you and your industry when these stories just seem like it's like every day it's a new thing? How does that affect you and your industry when you're trying to make decisions on? what to focus on because it just seems like you, you can go nuts trying to focus on everything and you can't obviously do that. So how, how do stories like that um, change your perspective and where you look and what you try to do next? Well, you know, it's a, it, it shows you that no matter what size the organization is, or if it's the federal government or, uh, you know, a trillion dollar company or a hundred, you know, a hundred thousand dollar company, everyone is susceptible to it. And when it comes down to it, it's the human factor that's going to be the cause one way or another, whether it's clicking on a link, misconfiguration, you know, bad design of a architecture, whatever it might be. Um, so it, it, it's, it's tough because there's even the smallest network is very complicated and you're relying on uh, vendors to, uh, patch things that, uh, or provide patches to, uh, vulnerabilities quickly. You're relying on individuals to do that patching once it's available. And, you know, that's the first step. But then, you know, all the other layers and controls that you have to put in place, you know, there's, there could be a perfect storm that could cause it to, you know, them all to fail. And, you know, if A, B, and C all aligns, the moons are and stars are aligned and it can happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even Microsoft has had that happen. Yeah. What was it earlier this year or later last year when their uh, their developer certificate got stolen out of a, a memory dump? You know, they had five or six different controls in place, but perfect storm happened and it's and, it, you know, it got out uh, because they all failed at the same time. And so, you know, even, you know, the big guys have issues with it. And, uh, you know, ever since, you know, uh, uh, I think since Sony, I think whenever that breach first happened and everything, you know, I was saying back then, even, you know, th this comes to show you, you got a multi-billion dollar company here that yeah. can't keep the bad guys out. You know, they had a movie that was going to be released and it offended the North Koreans. And, you know, the bad part for them was they took down, uh, you know, the PlayStation network. So then North Korea got DDoS because you don't mess with gamers, a bunch of tech people that's going to, you can't affect their games. They're going to come back at you, you know? So there was some retribution there, I guess, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. And, um, 
you know, it, it definitely weighs on CISOs and risk experts and stuff or your risk managers and the boards and everyone else that, you know, if, um, what are we doing? Where's, where's our exposure? Where's our risk at? And try to reduce that as much as possible and constantly monitoring for it and, and hoping that there's not, you know, a checkbox that's got unchecked and caused an exposure. When, when, uh, one of the questions that we, we got, um, in relation to this, this, um, uh, this particular podcast is about insider threat. So if a, if a company's listening to this and they're looking for some advice, what advice would you give around, um, maybe top one, two, three things, whatever you can think of that, that a company should be thinking about when it comes to insider threat as, as something they want to start preparing to protect against? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at, let's, let's take some of the zero trust principles around identity and least privilege. Um, you know, utilizing those components and, and trying to make sure your individuals just have, uh, access to what they truly need to have access to and then to have the proper monitoring in place and, uh, and authentication for whenever it does. And, you know, uh, you know, it really comes down to that governance, but then also just making sure that your teams have just what they ha- need access to. Um, you know, there's some insider threat monitoring tools you can have on the endpoints and everything. Some are good, some are bad. Um, they're usually pretty pricey. So, but you can sometimes get that with some other tool sets and then, you know, compile that data together to try to look for those things. Um, some of them might be more of, um, uh, protection versus de- uh, detection. I should say detection versus uh, protection off of it. So you might not be able to stop it, but at least you can see when it happened. Um, and, you know, hopefully maybe you can then have it trigger some other tool to do the, the, the protection state to keep it from, from going out. Uh, you know, blocking USB access, you know, for file share, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, having something to, you know, block share, sharing files to Dropbox and those sort of things. You know, there's some ways that you can do that. Um, you know, controlling your, uh, your email and what can go in it and what go out and, and, you know, you might be able to do something along that line, but it, it's, it's tough, but you have to look at it in layers and it depends on what your budget is and, and then, you know, what your risk acceptance is and maybe what type of data that you have. Do you have intellectual property? Well, you might want to have more controls around that, uh, versus what you might have around some of the other areas. So, you know, your segmentation of your data and of your network to control those other areas, um, which again, another pillar of zero trust. I like it. I like the layering approach. That's, that's really, really good. Um, so Mark, always at the end, we always ask a couple questions and I know we asked you this one before, but you know, we'll do it mm-hmm. again since it's our, it's our habit. Uh, mentors, mm-hmm. most of us haven't got to where we are without at least one person in our life that's helped us. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you think of a mentor that, that has really helped you with your career and just to get you where you are? Yeah. You know, there's, there's been a lot of them over the time where I, I can't say they necessarily sat down and said, Hey, you know, you want to do this and really kind of coached, but then there's, there has been others where just, you know, taking tidbits of information and, and, um, uh, advice from them or watching their styles and stuff, you know, so there's, uh, you know, I, there's some dating all the way back to when I was before I even got in technology. I had a manager, you know, from a customer service side and just how to deal with people and everything that was real big. And then, um, you know, probably more recently, the, um, you know, my current bosses and everything has been really, you know, instrumental on, uh, on, you know, guiding me, the, you know, whether it's from branding, my own personal brand or, uh, you know, uh, supporting, the strategic direction that we need to go. So, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, Balan Panaputi, which is our chief operating officer or, uh, um, Shelly Seaford, who was, uh, our CEO who recently retired, you know, they've always been really supportive over the last six years of me on, on things and help encouraging things. Um, another gentleman by the name of, uh, Tom Bakewell, he's been kind of mentoring me around, uh, board governance and helping me along that side. So, uh, so that's been, you know, a great experience and actually someone that's like, here, you know, read this and do this and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of help, 
you know, uh, help me align to, you know, for better uh, board governance. So, uh, you know, so that there has been, especially more recently, and has been help. And, and those are the type of things that, you know, I'm taking and then helping other people and, and you know, helping encouraging them and work with them to either get into my shoes someday or some other position. So uh-huh. that's wonderful. And um, are there any books that you've read recently that you would recommend? It doesn't have to be about the topic <laughs> we spoke about. It could be literally anything. I, you know, I have been on a, a, uh, a book iceberg here lately. I, <laughs> you know, I, I have not been uh, reading much. I've been reading a lot of, I read a lot of articles. And so because mm-hmm. of that, I really don't, I, by the time, uh, you know, I kind of sit down, it's like, I'm, I'm done. I just want to veg out and like not do I, anything. I and, um, you know, I was listening to, uh, uh, I can't even think the name of it. It was an audio book. Uh, it was a series, uh, uh, the sci-fi series for a while. I was listening to that. But then I kind of, I ran through those three or four books of that and, and, uh, and, but outside, but that was earlier this year. So it's been a, yeah, I, I haven't really read too much lately. Uh, I know I should, but. Yeah. Same as you. I kind of go yeah. through like uh, six months ago or so I was reading a ton and then I, I got super busy and I was traveling and I have like a stack of books here. And I'm like, well, I should grab one for the plane. And I just slept. Yeah. I didn't even read. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. I just slept. I didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't open it once. Carried I did it the same weeks. thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I turned on the TV that was there and sat there and watched uh, John Wick instead. So that was. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark, if people want to uh, follow you or connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best way off of there. I mean, I'm on, uh, you know, like Twitter and stuff, but I don't think I've ever sent out a tweet. So I, you know, I wouldn't look for me there, really. <laughs> You're not missing uh, much. I can tell yeah, you that right now. You're yeah. not missing or, much. <laughs> excuse me, uh, formerly known as Twitter X. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, you can't uh, say Twitter but, anymore. You have to say X. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but LinkedIn's probably the best, best way, you know, and if you do connect, don't try to sell me something right away. Don't try to ask for 15 <laughs> minutes because I'm just going to, Read on past Locked. you and just keep on go. Yeah. yeah. And, I, I uh, but I'm happy to connect. When, so when they just kind of, you could tell it's a form, mm-hmm. you know, you could tell it's a form. <laughs> like I get these all the time, like where my, my top uh, one, because it was, it's the newest is my being a adjunct professor at university of Arizona. So I get these, wow, your LinkedIn is so impressive. Uh, I'd love to help you with marketing at University of Arizona. And I'm like, yeah. you obviously didn't even try, man. You didn't yeah. even try. Like, I'm an yeah. adjunct professor. I got nothing to do with marketing it. You know, like, it's like delete block, you know. I, I got one the other day and it didn't even have my name in it. It had someone else's <laughs> name in it. It's like, at least change the name. Right. Know? At least try before you copy paste, right? At least. That's right. <laughs> it's That's the right. AI. It's just, it's all <laughs> over the place now. <laughs> Obviously, that model is not very good. <laughs> yeah, obviously that one's not thinking too well. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, thank you so much, Mark, for coming on again. This was another fascinating conversation. I'm glad we ended laughing and not crying because I thought for a minute <laughs> we were going to all just like be needing a, a whiskey or something by the end of this podcast. Yeah, it, w- it was going a little dark there for a little bit. That's for sure. Dark, yeah. I was going to have to unplug the tin can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, be like, that's it. I'm not coming with these cans anymore. <laughs> And uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. And, and thanks for, for all the knowledge and the experience that you share with us here. Thanks for having me and uh, happy to come back again later on. So yeah, thanks for we'll having do me. Do it again. And thank, thank you. you all for joining us uh, this month. And next month, we'll have another great security professional joining Ryan and I as we have another discussion around what you can do to stay safe and secure. So until then, do just that. Stay safe and secure. See you.